Good evening, and welcome to Oregon's virtual Out Loud event. I'm Robin Wheeler-Grange, the head of state, local, and regional public affairs and outreach at Oregon, and I'm pleased to have all of you join us for this forum. Let me begin with some housekeeping remarks to help get you the, the most out of this event. I recommend first that you turn off your VPN for best connection and experience. Your video and audio were automatically turned off when you joined. The public chat has been disabled for this event. If you are having trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, or if you have any questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A module by clicking the icon that looks like two talk bubbles. A member of our team will assist you with technical issues. And later in the program, our moderator will facilitate a Q&A session, at which time your questions will be addressed. We will answer as many questions as time allows. Last, please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted for viewing at a later time. By participating in this session, attendees consent to being recorded. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Oregon's Laboratory Director, Paul Kearns. Paul, take it away. Thank you very much, Robin. Let me end my welcome to our virtual out loud lecture. Tonight, we celebrate Oregon's 75th anniversary, and we look forward to the next 75 years of discovery and impact. I'm Paul Kearns, and I have the honor of serving as the Laboratory Director of Oregon National Laboratory. Tomorrow actually marks the date of Argonne's founding as a national laboratory. Since July 1, 1946, Argonne has been conducting cutting edge basic and applied research for our country. Our first research was on nuclear energy. We trace our roots to the Manhattan Project with the founding mission to develop peaceful uses for nuclear power. Over the decades, we've expanded to what we are today, a multidisciplinary science and engineering research center accelerating our country's security and prosperity. Our innovations, such as commercial nuclear reactors, medical tools like the first ultrasound and advanced batteries that power everything from electric vehicles to cell phones have been remarkable. Our world-class community of talent has been honored with Nobel Prizes, R&D 100 awards, and countless grants and patents. Uh, our operations have kept our campus and neighboring communities informed, engaged, and safe. America would be very different without Argonne and all that we have accomplished throughout the amazing history of our laboratory. I'm delighted tonight to have the opportunity to share our plans for the future of our laboratory uh, with our program sponsors, our partners, and you, the taxpayers who have supported us over the decades. Each year, we review our initiatives, our research initiatives for the future. We select fields to focus on that have the greatest potential for the biggest impact for as many people as possible. We also recently held an internal visioning uh, exercise that predicted how the world and how our laboratory would function in 2050. Simply put, at Argonne, we're always planning for tomorrow and beyond. That's what we will discuss this evening. We will share with all of you some of the most promising scientific fields for the future, such as neuroscience, climate modeling, astrophysics, and medical radioisotopes. These are just a few of the disciplines that will likely transform our society for the better. To help lead these presentations in the panel discussion, we have Stephen Streifer, Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Technology and the Interim Associate Laboratory Director for Photon Sciences. He will serve as our moderator for tonight's Out Loud Lecture. Thank you, Stephen, for guiding the discussion. Please begin our program. Well, thanks very much, Paul. I'm Stephen Streifer. I have the honor of serving as the Deputy Laboratory Director of Science and Technology at Argonne National Laboratory, and I have to say it really is a dream job. I'm also Interim Associate Laboratory Director for Photon Sciences and the Director of the Advanced Photon uh, Source, which you actually can see from an airplane as you fly over Argonne. It's the big round thing. In my role, I had the privilege of spearheading the lab's Argonne 2050 initiative that Paul referenced earlier. Uh, the purpose of this exercise was really to envision, evaluate, and lay the groundwork so that we can continue to solve long-term and emerging problems, support new technologies and research as they emerge, and adapt to the most effective and rewarding ways for employees and collaborators to work together. The work we will do provide cleaner energy, better health, added security, new technologies, and a deeper understanding of the environment, our Earth, and the universe in which it sits. And we'll hear a lot about that tonight. Several of these fields of study are the foundation for this discussion this evening. 
We'll spend the next few minutes hearing from some of Argonne's leading scientists who through their eyes will give us a glimpse of the future in the areas of medical isotopes, brain mapping, climate change, and cosmology. So joining me for the discussion this evening are Dave Roach, Deputy Program Manager for the Radioisotope Research and Production Program, or RRPP. Dave and his scientists have a research focus on improving disease diagnosis and developing treatments for tackling cancer and other infectious diseases. With RRPP, their goal is to increase the availability of radioactive isotopes to researchers in hospitals and to assist in the development of new therapies that can save lives in the future. Our next pa panelist is Narayanan Bobby Kasturi. Bobby is a neuroscience researcher at Argonne and an adjunct professor in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Chicago. By applying ground groundbreaking techniques for large scale comprehensive mapping of the brain, Bobby and his team are creating images that help them gain insight on how brains mature and age and how brains differ across individuals, species, and with disease. Arguably, the brain is the most important organ in the human body. So the impact of this research for the future is really immeasurable. We're also joined by Scott Collis, atmospheric scientist at Argonne. Scott leads scientists who share his desire to better understand clouds, storms, and the basic physics of our atmosphere. His team is using, using artificial intelligence, open source software, and machine learning to greatly accelerate our knowledge of the atmosphere and improve atmospheric simulations. The intent of this research is to identify vulnerabilities and make faster and more accurate predictions about the future of our planet. Our final panelist is Katrin Heitman, Deputy Division Director in High Energy Physics. Objects in the universe are moving away from one another at an accelerated rate. This fact goes against conventional wisdom, which suggests the gravitational attraction of matter in the universe should cause a deceleration in the universe's expansion. Katrin's team of scientists are trying to understand the causes for the unexpected acceleration by using observations from deep sky surveys and supercomputing simulations. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating this evening. Now, before we start our discussion, I'd like to remind you to ask questions throughout the evening by using the Q&A module in Zoom. Just click the icon that looks like two talk bubbles and post your questions. Later in the program, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. Now, let's start by having each panelist briefly tell us about the research they're engaged in and what scientific questions you're looking to answer. Dave, why don't you start us off? Thanks, Stephen. That was an excellent introduction. So let's jump right in. There are several ways to treat cancer. And, uh, advance the slide, please. We can cut it out. Uh, this approach is only good for localized cancers. And if we are lucky, we get everything. If we are not, the cancer can grow back. Radiation therapy is another method that is good for localized cancers, where you sit in front of a beam of radiation that is used to kill cancer. However, if the cancer is spread, we need to move to a whole body approach like chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is when we add, inject a drug um, to treat the cancer. Unfortunately, it is indiscriminately killing healthy and unhealthy cells alike. This is one reason why we get all those nasty side effects that people widely associate with cancer treatments. Now, targeted radionuclide therapy is an elegant approach and considered to be the magic bullet in diagnosing and treating cancers. This method uses radioactive drug, drugs specifically engineered to target cancers. This is possible because all cells express certain biomarkers, represented here by these little mushrooms on our cancer tissue. This enables us to differentiate between healthy and unhealthy cells. And we can create drugs that are specific to these biomarkers. For example, the structure shown on the right is a drug that is designed to target prostate cancer. The part in the green circle represents our biovector that seeks out the biomarker. Alone, it doesn't do too much. So we have this blue circle that we can insert a radioactive component. Advance the slide, please. The blue part locks up the radioisotope in this construct, and together the green and blue is an example of a radiopharmaceutical that can be injected into patients, as depicted in the image at the bottom. Once injected, the green part tows the blue part to the cancer. Anything that doesn't make it to the cancer is excreted, largely preventing collateral damage to other tissues. Advance the slide, please. With this approach, we are able to get amazing results like these where each of these patients were suffering from metastatic prostate cancer and had exhausted every other treatment option. In these studies shown here, the patients were injected with diagnostic radiopharmaceutical to first visualize the tumors. That's all the red and black dots that were seen there. 
other than the kidneys, of course. Uh, the patients were then treated with a radiopharmaceutical um, to treat the cancer. And what's amazing here is that the patients in these studies saw complete or nearly complete remission of their tumors. An important note is that one size does not necessarily fit all. A treatment for one person might not work for another. Therefore, it is important to have a wide arsenal in the fight against cancer. With this, and this is where argon really comes in. We support the development of radiopharmaceuticals by producing the radioisotope component. Uh, now, this all sounds great, but all of this together is extremely hard, especially making the radioisotope. Advance the, advance the slide, please. We can't all be like Tony Stark and make our own accelerator in our basement and then create new elements like you did in Iron Man. Um, advance the slide, please. However, in reality, what he's doing is not too far off. As depicted at the top, we accelerate particles with powerful accelerators and then slam them into target elements. This knocks out other particles from the target, changing the atomic structure of the element. Depending on what we knock out, we get stable or radioactive elements. Unfortunately, only a few atoms are converted. Uh, the starting material is mostly unchanged except for those few atoms. So we need to develop technologies to separate those few atoms from the bulk using clever chemistry. Once isolated and purified, we can send the radioisotope out the door to medical practitioners or researchers. Because this is a difficult process, there's a lack of supply of several crucial radioisotopes and several very promising ones are not yet available. Argon and other DOE isotope program scientists are developing ways to produce, separate and distribute radioisotopes to the medical community to accelerate drug discovery and ultimately, like Iron Man, save lives. Advance the slide, please. At Argon, we leverage our highly skilled workforce and specialized facilities to investigate unique radioisotope production and purification pathways. We use supercomputers super, super uh, to design and simulate experiments prior to performing them. And then we use our uh, unique accelerators to perform the physical investigation of the new production pathways. Once made, we can then use our radiological facilities to safely process and purify the radioisotope of interest. Advance the slide, please. An example of is copper 67. We produce this for distribution through the DOE isotope program. This radioisotope is a very interesting one as it was originally thought as only as a therapeutic isotope. Now in collaboration with the University of Iowa, we use this chest phantom that is shown on the left to prove that copper 67 is a theranostic isotope capable of diagnosing and treating cancer. So instead of injecting someone with multiple radiopharmaceuticals, we inject them with a single copper 67 based radiopharmaceutical and visualize uh, the tumor treatment in real time. Advance the slide, please. These and other isotopes are made available through the DOE isotope program who supports world leading research and development associated with creating novel and more efficient uh, isotope production and processing te techniques to assure availability of critical isotopes that are in short supply. We are one of several production sites across the United States whose production efforts are coordinated through the DOE Isotope Program's National Isotope Development Center. In the end, we are part of a team committed to making radioisotopes available for groundbreaking research and developments that lead to life-saving medicine. Thank you for the opportunity to share our program with you today. Stephen, back to you. Thanks, Dave. Really fascinating stuff. And it's really great to see the way that uh, we're uh, trying to improve human health. Let's turn to Bobby now. Bobby, can you give us a little bit of an uh, overview of what you're talking about when you talk about brain mapping? What is it and what's involved in your research? Stephen, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, uh, thank you all for your uh, for attending. As Stephen said, my name is uh, Narayan and Bobby Kasturi. I'm a neuroscience researcher at Argonne and uh, uh, assistant professor in the neurobiology department at the University of Chicago. And the thing I'd like to talk to you about is these efforts that we have at the university and at Argonne to map the brain. And just to remind us all, the brain is about a three pound organ. If you cup your, uh, um, if you cupped it, uh, 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 your hands in front of you, the brain would fit uh, uh, exactly uh, 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 in your hands. Uh, uh, and we use it to study everything from nuclear isotopes and how the universe expands and, and climate change. And we believe that studying it will reveal uh, uh, insights that, we, uh, that will fundamentally change how we think about the world around us. Now, there are many things that we can learn about the brain. The thing that I'm specifically interested in, I'd like to show you on the next slide. 
So even before I, uh, uh, I was a neuroscientist, I was interested in this particular idea about brains, which is how brains grow up. And to sort of kind of illustrate that for you, uh, in this slide on the, on the bottom, I put the adult pictures of three uh, very famous individuals, Jane Goodall all the way on the left, Mahatma Gandhi and Albert Einstein. And although you might be familiar with their adult pictures, you may be less familiar with their baby pictures, which you can see on the top row. And the argument that I'd like to make is although there are some similarities between those baby pictures and their adult pictures, for example, it seems Jane has always had a love of animals. There are uh, uh, Jane, Mahatma and Albert as children really had no idea of what they would grow into. Just the same way that many of us when we were children had no idea of what we would grow into because like for them and like for us, the world changes us and our experiences of the world change us. And I would argue that that's what makes us fundamentally human, that our brains can somehow take in information from the world and learn from it. And you might say, that's it sounds like a very good question. Why hasn't this problem been solved? And one of the reasons, uh, there are several reasons why the problem hasn't been solved. One of them I'd like to highlight for you on the next slide. please, Because it turns out in human brains, like in all of your brains in the audience, we think that there are something like a hundred billion brain cells or neurons, uh, uh, and that these neurons make connections with every other uh, uh, neuron in the brain. And in the human brain, we think on average, there are about 10,000 connections per neuron, which means in your brain, there is literally more than a galaxy's worth of connections, meaning you multiply those numbers together, you get a number like a quadrillion, which is really like the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Now to fit something uh, that's the number of a quadrillion into the volume of, uh, uh, of, of my head, you have to make each neuron and each connection so small that most traditional microscopes uh, uh, can't view those connections. Now, luckily for me and for the field, we can use some of those remarkable microscopes that exist at the advanced photon source to actually map those connections. But that then actually reveals a second problem, which we feel like places like uh, argon can solve, which is in the next slide which is that no matter even the smallest brain, here I'm showing you an example of a mouse brain on the left and sort of in scale, uh, the human brain here on the right. If I took that mouse brain and I took an extremely small piece of it, uh, as you see here uh, 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 on someone's fingertip, even that very small piece of brain mapped at the resolution to find every connection between a neuron would be a kind of data called a petabyte. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what a petabyte means, that's about 13 years of HDTV played end to end. If I wanted to do just a little bit more, a little bit bigger volume, 1.5 petabytes, that's the size of the 10 billion photos that exist on Facebook. Now remember, a mouse brain is a thousand times bigger than this just single petabyte, and the human brain is a thousand times bigger than that. And so what does that mean? It means soon we will collect the single largest data set about anything ever collected in the history of the world. And it's thanks to places like Argon and their supercomputers that will ultimately help us analyze and make sense of it. And why would we wanna make sense of this? What's, why would we undertake a task this big? Well, on the next slide, I, I hope to, to tell you the reasons why we think these kinds of approaches are important. First, for a, a, a lot of neuroscientists, the strong hypothesis is that everything about you, every skill, every memory, every hope, every dream that you have is somehow encoded in that incredible cobweb of 100 billion neurons making 10,000 connections. Second, we think now more and more every day that a lot of diseases, a lot of mental illnesses, potentially diseases that you may have heard of like schizophrenia or autism are actually miswirings. Uh, uh, of inappropriate or remaining inappropriate connections between neurons. And that once we can understand the physical basis of these mental illnesses, we'll be able to help provide rational therapy to try to solve. And the last one, and one of the ones I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in, I hear every day about how artificial intelligence algorithms do things as well as human beings. Chess, Go, I heard recently poker. Uh, uh, while, while that might be true, there are still many things that brains can do, even simple mouse brains that uh, most of our algorithms cannot do. And I'll leave you with one of them. Uh, uh, all of your brains uh, operate at about 20 watts uh, 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 of energy. And most of the light bulbs in the rooms that we're sitting at are maybe 60 watts. Uh, uh, and although you may have thought 
of many of your colleagues and friends and even relatives as dim bulbs, you've been right. Uh, uh, it's what they can do with that amount of energy that remains remarkable and, and not able to be replicated by any other algorithm or machine that we know of. Uh, 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 thank you very much for this opportunity. Stephen, back to you. Thanks, Bobby. Really interesting. And I uh, look forward to hearing more about it as the night goes on. So let's turn uh, now to a uh, different topic. Scott, we're hearing a lot about climate change in the environment. Can you tell us about the aspects of the field of study that you're exploring? Thank you very much, Stephen, and good evening, everyone. Can you advance to the next slide, please? One goal of atmospheric science is to build a predictive understanding of the weather and climate. But what does this mean? This means that we take all our knowledge of the atmosphere and we pack it into computer simulations. We then run these simulations to, in essence, try to predict the future and see how well we do, how good our understanding of all these different components of the atmosphere, from the smallest snowflake to the largest hurricane, is. Next slide, please. But how do we learn this knowledge? By observing the atmosphere. Argonne scientists work with the atmospheric radiation measurement, use a facility to use advanced instruments like this weather radar you see in the top panel here to carve out sectors of the sky to build four dimensional images so three dimensions plus time of the atmosphere including deep thunderstorms like i'm actually just having outside my window now in clarendon hills um, and these four dimensional images help us make better models better climate models but what do we do with this knowledge when we create knowledge, we have a duty to share it. We share it through things like open science, open source software, where we package up all the computer code to be used to make these images. Mentorship, mentoring young students, including in underserved communities, which is one way we can achieve environmental justice, and through scientific communications. And in the region of climate change and climate science, this is particularly important because climate affects us all and sometimes in very subtle ways. Next slide, please. <clears throat> But now I want to pause and take a look back in time to the origins of the meteorological sciences. The earliest form of predictive understanding was weather forecasters literally going outside and looking at the sky. They would observe various atmospheric phenomena and then learn what happens next. An example of this is early forecasters when they saw these really thin translucent clouds moving from the west across to the east they learn that this usually forecasted rain, often the next day. We know now this is because large thunderstorms, when they transport water vapor from the surface of the planet into the upper atmosphere, it gets moved from those strong upper level winds as ice clouds over us, showing that those thunderstorms are coming the next day. Well, now our leading edge is trying to do exactly that same thing with computer algorithms. This is artificial intelligence, trying to train algorithms to think more like us, to train algorithms using atmospheric observations to try and build predictive understanding. But one thing we've found is AI that is developed by the likes of Amazon and Google and Facebook it really doesn't cut it. We need new AI, AI that actually has a knowledge of the underlying physics of the atmosphere. This is what we need to build new climate models and better prediction. Next slide, please. One final bit of research our team is doing that I want to share with you is using artificial intelligence to guide observations. We've all seen an example of autonomous data collection, right? like the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. So operators, when they're running this helicopter system, they don't tell it exactly where to go. They give it a very broad set of instructions. The helicopter then adjusts to its environment, avoiding hazards and collecting data. This is an example of artificial intelligence at the edge. And by the edge, I mean edge computing. And edge computing is where we take computers like this little Raspberry Pi and put it right up against where we collect our data. This allows for very 
agile computation, very quick changing of the way these sensors adapt to their environment and collect new observations. This supercharges the collecting of these 4D images, like I showed you before, more efficiently collecting the data we need to build better simulations of our climate. And you might ask, well, Scott, we know the climate's changing. Why do we need better simulations of the climate? It's because decision makers are asking us more and more what happens next? What is our new one in 100 year storm? How many more tornadoes do we expect DuPage County to get in a future climate? Basically, we're allowing decision makers to better adapt to climate change and build a more resilient nation. Thank you very much. Back to you, Stephen. Thanks, Scott. Uh, really just a, a great topic given what we're experiencing right now on the west uh, coast of the US and around the country. So, Katrin, let's turn to you now with an exploration of the dark universe, which really just boggles my mind. Why don't you tell us what the term dark universe refers to and what questions you're seeking to answer? Thank you, Stephen, and good evening, everybody. Next slide, please. My research focuses on understanding the makeup and evolution of our universe from the very early times to today. We have learned a lot about cosmology in the last three decades, but at the same time, we have encountered some of the biggest puzzles in physics. We have learned that 95% of the universe is dark. 69% of the matter energy content is a mysterious agent that drives the accelerated expansion of the universe, a discovery that was made in 1998 by observing distant exploding stars or supernovae. This discovery is often called dark energy. Since then, we have made a lot of effort to understand the nature of this dark energy component of the universe, but we still have many questions to answer. The remaining 31% of the matter energy content is split into 80% of a dark matter component and 20% of regular matter that you and me are made of. We call dark matter dark because it does not absorb or emit light. And so far, we have only been able to see it indirectly. For example, when we observe how the light on its way through the universe is bent when it encounters large structures of dark matter. Many experiments are ongoing to try to maybe capture a dark matter particle or to see it in a collider experiment. My research focuses on using the regular matter and in particular galaxies to try to understand the nature of dark energy. How does the distribution of galaxies on the sky changes if we assume different physics underlying the dark energy component? Can, we, can ever more detailed observations help us to find a smoking gun to solve the mystery of the origin of dark energy? How can the largest supercomputers aid us in this quest? Next slide, please. In order to explore the physics of the dark universe, the community is currently building a major new observatory in the foothills of the Chilean Andes. The Vera Rubin Observatory will carry out the 10-year legacy survey of space and time, or LSST, and observe half of the sky, recording 37 billion stars and galaxies. The observatory is named after the famous astronomer Vera Rubin, whose work provided some of the first evidence for dark matter. In order to enable this extraordinary survey, an enormous 3,200 megapixel camera was built. The camera weighs more than three tons and will produce images so large that 1,500 high definition TV screens would be required to view just one of them. Next slide, please. How can we use this record breaking data set to explore the dark universe? First, we formed a very large collaboration that will work jointly on this task. The LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration, or LSST Desk, has more than 1,000 members worldwide. And I have the honor for the next two years, actually starting tomorrow, to lead the collaboration as their spokesperson. We will measure the distribution of galaxies from the new data set to learn about the evolution and content of the universe. For example, we can ask the question, how strongly are galaxies clustered? We can measure the pairwise distances between galaxies and compare it to a random distribution. We have done this in the past and the clustering strength has given us important clues about dark energy. The LSST data set will increase our sample tremendously and therefore will allow us to explore this question in much more detail. We can also find clusters of galaxies, the most massive bound structures in the universe. We can count them and find them at different epochs. Here in this inset image, what you see is one of those clusters observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. The abundance of clusters and the evolution of the abundance will help us explore the nature of dark energy. Next slide, please. Finally, we will employ the largest supercomputers to make progress on the deep questions about the dark universe. 
The LSSD desk has carried out an end-to-end -end simulation to generate a data set that closely mimics what the, universe, uh, what, what the telescope will see during the five years of observations on a small patch, patch that is 60 times smaller than the full survey. In the background image here on this slide, you can see the result of the simulation. It contains galaxies and stars, effects of the atmosphere between the telescope and the galaxies, effects from the CCDs that are used to record the images, and many more details to create a realistic universe. The simulation underlying this effort is one of the largest simulations available worldwide and was carried out by our group here at Argon on the supercomputer Mira. Simulations are very useful to also explore different physics scenarios that we want to understand from the data. You see the distribution of dark matter from three different simulations on the slide on the left. The first box shows you what we call the standard model of cosmology and which includes a dark energy component in the way I explained at the start. Now we can also switch off the accelerated expansion of the universe and do all measurements as we would on the data as well. We would find stronger clustering of the galaxies. We can also choose to change the assumptions about dark matter and give it a small temperature. This was, would wash out the structures in the universe and we could observe that as well. As you can imagine, we want to improve our simulations further with the advent of the data from the Rubin Observatory and the arrival of Aurora, which will be one of the most powerful su supercomputers in the world. Argon is well positioned to make crucial contributions to this target. I'm keen talking to you again in 10 years and see what we have learned with the help of this amazing data set and the crucial capability available here at Argon. Thank you very much and back to Stephen. Thanks for train. Uh, that's uh, really great. So let's actually bring everybody back now. Um, we're going to do this in reverse order, but just to uh, start kicking off the discussion, uh, the moderator is going to take the uh, privilege of the moderator. We've got a few questions I was going to kick us off with, and we're going to start with Katrin. Um, you shared that dark matter tends to pull the universe together and dark energy tends to drive it apart. So we've got these two competing interactions. Uh, you talked a little bit about um, how that shapes galaxies. Could you tell us a little bit more about how this cosmic struggle affects the fate of the universe? Thanks, Stephen, for this very interesting question. Currently, it looks like the dark energy is winning, and with time, we see fewer and fewer galaxies in our neighborhood. Interestingly, if we would have lived just a few billion years earlier, we would not have been able to measure the impact of dark energy. It would have been too small. We seem to be living in a rather special era in the cosmic evolution, with the dark matter and dark energy content are of the same order of magnitude. This is often called the cosmological coincidence problem and one of the puzzles we hope to solve. Why do we live at the time in the cosmic history where we can measure the impact of dark energy? Coming back to the question about the fate of the universe, at some point in the very far future, if our current picture of dark energy is correct, we would not be able to carry out a survey like the legacy survey of space and time because galaxies would be so far away that we could not make these incredible maps that we are making today. So it would be impossible to study the universe in the way we are doing it today. Fortunately, I will be long retired at this point. Back to you, Steve. Great answer. All right, Scott, your turn. Um, so we're going to take it down a scale. We're going to go to the universe, to the Earth. So back to our cosmic home. Um, so based on your research and the climate modeling that we're doing today, what kind of forecasting will we be able to do in the future? What can we expect when we turn on the news uh, 10 years from now? That's a great uh, question, Stephen. I mentioned that we use our knowledge of the atmosphere to predict the future, but that prediction is only as good as our current knowledge of the state of the atmosphere, where the clouds are now, where the storms are now, where the heat is now. We actually use those simulations I talked about before to take that time zero and move it forward. So what I expect in the future is, like I talked about with our edge computing, that when there's a weather event, we will have autonomous AI-driven drones that we can send to where these events are happening. To, and then we can also use these surrogate models, these AI models to do predictions, to work out where can we take really targeted predictions. These predictions that help reduce the uncertainty of our forecasts and help decision makers make better decisions. But most importantly, I expect for us to include people in these simulations, because weather's one thing, but the way in which a person is impacted by the weather or by climate change really can vary a lot depending on the infrastructure they have around them. We see this a lot in tornadoes. So I expect for us to really bring together hydrologists, engineers, 
and social scientists to actually include the human component in our models of climate change, which helps us in a very environmentally just way build a more resilient nation. So I'm going to riff for a second and actually take one of the questions from the chat just because I think it follows directly on that. So one of the questions we have is any research being done to proactively mitigate the effects of bad weather, bad, bad, bad weather events? Um, and that's sort of what you're talking about now. Could you uh, just spend a couple of seconds on that? So yes, and I would love to see more. That's a really great question because that really is where we're going towards with smart cities and the idea of an instrumented smart city. I'll give you an example, and that is the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District in Chicago actually has control over a lot of the hydrological infrastructure. And when they know there's a bad weather event, they can move water around in their storage systems. What I'm really interested to see is how do we use things like the lake breeze to bring cool air into people's home. And an active area of research between ourselves and Northwestern University is how do we use green infrastructure to better ameliorate the effects of flooding like what we just saw happen uh, last weekend. Thanks, very fascinating. Bobby, let's take it back to the brain. And you talked about the brain as being as extensive as a galaxy, making that connection to Ketrin. Um, with a vast series of connections to explore, what brain mapping, mapping focus do you have today that you believe will be most impactful over the next decades? What's going to be the most important thing that comes from your research? So, uh, so if it's okay, I'd like to give two answers, but I'll make it quick. Uh, I think, it was great. Uh, I think the two that I, 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 of many that I, I find will be most impactful is that we're already starting to figure out the physical basis of a bunch of mental illnesses and, and, and diseases. And I, I trained as a physician, and, and I remember uh, then and now that a lot of our therapies uh, 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 by doctors who are some of the smartest people in the hospital are really um, uh, ad hoc. We don't have a good theory for why some drugs work on some illnesses and not. And I feel like once we can understand the physical basis, i.e. how these miswirings occur, then we can really start to uh, uh, come up with better therapies, more rational therapies uh, uh, for these illnesses that, uh, uh, that, that we, our loved ones, and uh, suffer and we see all around us. That's the first. The second on a more philosophical note that I'm interested in is when we look in the microscope at a neuron from a mouse or a primate or uh, 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 et cetera, they all look the same. Inside of them, they all seem to have the same molecules. All their connections look the uh, 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 same. So something magical seems to happen when we put them in a particular arrangement or a certain number of them, and we're able to produce brains that have senses of humors and introspection, uh, uh, et cetera. And a different arrangement produces an octopus that can control eight arms, uh, 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 et cetera. So I think we'll soon be able to understand how species uh, create intelligent solutions, different species create intelligent solutions to the problems they face just by potentially rearranging neurons and connections in one brain versus the other. I think what I'm trying to say is we will try to figure out what it means to be human by seeing what those differences are in those connections. And I think we'll be coming back to that one. So keep that thought going. So um, really transitioning still on the topic of uh, diseases and uh, uh, human health. Dave, using pharmaceuticals to diagnose and treat cancer and other diseases, obviously very exciting. Based on the research and development underway, can we anticipate a future where radio pharmaceuticals are used to tackle diseases of the brain, maybe treat some of the issues that Bobby is bringing up? And the, of course, these are some of the most debilitating illnesses that uh, people experience. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, yeah, it's definitely a tough question to answer. <laughs> and I'm not exactly an expert in neuroscience like Bobby or a psychologist. And there are so many different mental disorders that plague our world, and they affect each individual differently. So it's difficult to say which ones are really the worst ones. But like Bobby was saying, the human mind is an extremely complex system and we still don't fully understand it. If we think about some of the more common and well-known disorders, we can think we think of mostly like uh, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, addictions, uh, anxiety, and mood disorders like bipolar and depression. And there have been some really interesting studies out there already with um, using radio pharmaceuticals to observe the brain function of these people suffering from these diseases. Some of these studies look at the blood flow in the brain, while others look at the uh, activity of the brain based on certain stimuli. And this is coming more from a, uh, a chemical perspective than it is from a neurological perspective. But these scientists have put uh, diagnostic agents on highly addictive drugs, for example, to observe the brain function of those that are battling addiction compared to those that are not. One of the major differences observed was the amount of dopamine in the striatum, where dopamine is basically the chemical messenger and the striatum is the reward center for the brain. 
So the addicted individual either have a natural lack of, or after years of abuse, induce a lack of the ability to produce this dopamine. And then they seek to enhance the dopamine signaling and thus abuse substances to help generate more dopamine and that feel good sensation. Ultimately, more stimuli is required to get that feel good sensation, and thus the downward spiral of addiction begins. The bottom line is that the addicted individual's brain chemistry isn't working the way that it should. In the case of a degenerative disease like Alzheimer's, uh, plaque and fiber build up on, on and in the brain. Scientists are developing radio pharmaceuticals to observe the growth of these plaques and fibers in order to better understand the disease uh, and thus treat it. And this is actually true for any disease or any problem, right? If we want to figure out how to solve it, we first need to understand it. Um, for example, we were able to develop a vaccine for COVID, and I'm, I'm using the royal we here, in less than a year. This is an amazing accomplishment and a testament to what we could accomplish as a community when we pool our resources for a unified response. Uh, the reason why these scientists were able to create a vaccine in under a year is because they were able to identify the virus, break it down to the cellular level, and really understand it. Now, again, that's an example of a non-radioactive uh, pharmaceutical. However, the true is also um, the same as true for radio pharmaceuticals. So if you circle back to your original question, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, we are currently using radio pharmaceuticals to unlock the mysteries of the brain. And uh, the future is to continue developing these methods to more fully understand how these diseases work so that we can develop the early detection methods and better ways to treat these types of diseases. Thanks. Uh, it's uh, just truly fascinating. So um, one of the themes that we've heard uh, actually through a lot of, a lot of the uh, discussion already is around artificial intelligence, machine learning. And that's something that we're working very hard on at Argonne. Uh, we very strongly feel that that's a future uh, tool that we can use in a lot of our research uh, and address really some of the most challenging problems that in many ways are just not tractable today. So what are some of the exciting future discoveries artificial intelligence is likely to uh, help with each of you in your research areas? And does AI provide opportunities for collaboration with your research areas? And Bobby, I'm gonna start with you and I'm gonna extend that with another question, uh, again, pulling from uh, one of the questions in the chat. Do we really think that what we're doing with AI right now is the same as the brain and the way in which the brain does computations and stores information? So Bobby, to you. Uh, not to put you on the spot. No, no, it's an excellent question, Steve. So I think the, uh, the relationship between neuroscience and AI has historically actually gone in both directions. The obvious way that we benefit from AI uh, uh, is that someone is going to have to look at the, the trillions of gigabytes of data that I want to collect and trace those neurons and see how, and find their connections. That would literally be impossible uh, 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 without AI and not just AI. AI leveraged on the uh, 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 supercomputers at Argonne. It's not just that we need the algorithms, we need something to, 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 to run them on. So I think both of those are, are critical for imagining even mapping the smallest volume of the brain. But to uh, tackle the second question uh, 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 this way, the other interesting thing is that neuroscience has often served as an inspiration uh, 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 for AI. So the current neural networks, the current machine learning uh, AI algorithms, will actually have layers in them with nodes that connect between them modeled after how uh, the very first uh, uh, understandings of cortex. So in our brain, there's a part called cortex. The cortex has layers, one neuron after the other. The uh, computer scientists were working, I think, next door to the neuroscientists and therefore took that architecture. Now that currently is more inspiration than blueprint, uh, i.e. I don't think anyone would say that uh, uh, beyond inspiration, our neural networks, our artificial intelligence algorithms in any way mimic what we think the cobweb looks like in the uh, 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 brain, it certainly uh, 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 provides inspiration. But what is interesting, I think, which has actually caused a little bit of controversy uh, 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 in neuroscience is that that little amount of inspiration has led to these algorithms that do almost as well as our brains do in detecting stimuli and uh, uh, et cetera. And so I think a maybe slightly, but not that flippant answer was why does it matter? Uh, if we can get the algorithms to do uh, what brains do at some uh, 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 approximation, whether the wiring inside actually matches what a brain does or not might be irrelevant if we can solve the problem at the high level. That's excellent point, excellent point. So Dave, let's let's get your take on AI. How does it help with radio pharmaceuticals and what you're trying to work on? Yeah, that's great. Um, 
AI definitely can play a role. Um, one of the things that we do is um, with the radioisotope production applications thereof, it's an inherently interdisciplinary field. So we collaborate with basically everyone in every field. <laughs> and so we have so many experts and from so many different fields, there are always a lot of ideas to explore. Problem is that there usually isn't enough, uh, you know, resources, people, or funding to explore each idea. And as scientists, we like to think that each one of our ideas is the best one. However, that's not always the case. Don't, they don't always lead to amazing and worthwhile discoveries. AI could provide us a tool that can help down select our ideas so that we don't go chasing too many rabbit holes. AI can also help us make connections that we weren't able to make uh, on our own or come to these realizations much more quickly than we could on our own. For example, uh, an AI could very quickly decide what combination of radioisotope and pharmaceutical should be used to treat a specific cancer. AI could help us determine the best radioisotope production route or the best way to purify that radioisotope. This might help eliminate a lot of the trial and error that's associated with the research and development, helping to streamline the transition of research from bench to bench side um, and thus save more lives. Now, one of the interesting challenges that we face in utilizing AI is that most of us currently in the field of radioisotope production and closely related fields don't necessarily speak AI. And those that speak AI don't necessarily speak radioisotope. <laughs> so there's a bit of a language barrier. What we need uh, is we need someone that can really be the interface between these physical sciences and the digital to help us explore the opportunity that is AI. Excellent. So now we're going to uh, turn to Katrin and uh, uh, continue the discussion about what AI can uh, do in the astrophysics community. And uh, Katrin, I want to throw another one at you. There are a couple of questions from the chat where people are uh, curious about what it really means to combine physics and AI algorithms. Um, what does it mean when you're trying to make an AI algorithm physics aware? So maybe if you and uh, Scott after her uh, can uh, try and weave that into your answer, that would be really fascinating as well. Okay, I will try that, Stephen. So first, um, so our, in cosmology, it provides uh, many opportunities for our collaboration to, to use AI. And um, our group has actually worked for many years in, in this area. So when, when we are collecting very large complex data sets in cosmology and therefore making it a perfect place for AI applications. So one example is that in these incredible data sets what we, that we collect, we often search for rare events. In the past, students would look through many, many, many images taken by the telescope and try to identify these events. The human eye is in fact really, really good at this. Um, but with billions of images, you would need a lot of graduate students for this task. Um, so that doesn't seem quite fair. AI can be extremely helpful in the situation to find these rare objects in large data sets. Um, another area is building prediction tools from, small, uh, from a small set of very exquisite simulations. So one can use AI methods to employ a small set of very accurate simulations that span, span some parameter ranges and predict outcomes for other parameter settings. We call these tools emulators and they play an important role in interpretation of our observations. There are many other examples. And so coming back to this question about the physics-based um, algorithms. So for example, with um, the image analysis, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We have a um, good training set, we train the AI, uh, AI algorithm. And um, from there, we can then really go into our large data sets and see if we can identify these very rare um, events. So, so that is super powerful and, and uh, kind of, I could call it classical application of AI. Um, where it gets much more complicated is if you want to forward model something and predict something, um, because then the training has to be, um, it's, it's, um, you can't get something out of um, what you're not putting in, so to speak. Um, and, and at that point, especially physicists become a little bit um, suspicious of AI um, because we don't want to extrapolate into a space where, um, where we don't know what's going on. So, so, so it's, it's complicated, but it's, it's also exciting. Everything that's complicated is exciting at the same time. So there are lots of opportunities for us. Um, yep, you're very well said. Scott, let's turn to you and uh, talk about AI and climate research. Oh, that's a, these, these are some great questions. Um, first of all, I just want to back up some of the things that were said before by Bobby and Dave, which is AI is really good for, for tackling complex data. I mean, I can actually hear my Alexa going off in the background, so I must have said something like that. Um, so another area that AI is really useful for is, you know, AI that's developed by Amazon and others is used for doing things like um, determining the difference between a cat and a dog. And I need to apologize just one second. Alexa, 
stop. Now, I didn't, I swear I did not script that, but it did actually <laughs> go off in the background. Um, so when you build an AI network, a neural network, you have all these neurons. And with something that's used to detect differences in images, it's based on different patterns in what a cat looks like and a dog looks like. So when it gets trained with a dog, when you feed that data in, those parts of the neural network light up. The idea between, behind physics of informed AI, and I say idea behind because frankly, we don't know. This is research. This is leading edge research here, which is why it's so exciting, is we want to make physical equations part of that neural network so that when there's a particular physical phenomena going and you're training something, it will recognize that this phenomena is occurring. And the idea about that is to take the black boxness out of the AI. This is a field known as explainable AI. So not only can I train an AI algorithm to help me determine what's a cat and what's a dog, I can say, oh, that's interesting. Why is it a cat? Why is it a dog? And how do I learn more about the characteristics of this cat and dog? For me, as an atmospheric scientist, it is, okay, this is what a hurricane looks like. As an atmosphere, as a, as a forecaster, I can look at that and go, that's a hurricane. Now I want an AI that can identify that and say, what makes it a hurricane? What physics is involved in this? Excellent. All right, so um, we've had some really great discussion so far. There are a lot of good questions in the uh, Q&A that I want to try to get to. Uh, so we're going to do this as a lightning round. We're going to try to get through as many of these as possible just so that we can uh, touch as many of uh, the people in the, in the audience as possible as well. So let me start off with one that's actually here at the bottom. And I'm going to turn this to, uh, to Katrin. So how is quantum playing a role in various research areas in Argonne? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking <laughs> what I should answer. <laughs> I'm it's trying to, to think about what to answer to this question. Um, so it's it's in it's it's in a lot of different um, places. Um, so um, obviously, quantum computing is is a very big um, deal these days, and and Argon is gearing up to play an important role. Um, How about sensing? Is there a role from quantum sensing, perhaps? Right, so for the dark matter detection, you can use quantum sensors um, to actually make progress there. Um, so that's a very interesting area. Yes, that's correct. So I'm gonna go now to uh, Scott and climate modeling. Um, is computer power still a limitation? Are we getting past that? Is that, is that the, the, the limiting factor? Or is it other things that are limiting our ability to simulate the climate? It is one of the things, especially when it comes to climate simulation itself, computer power is a limitation and not just computer power, it's, it's the particular type of computer you need. So the way in which we model the climate is we break the planet up into what we call grid cells. Imagine pixels in from your digital camera. And we model the way the atmosphere works in all those little pixels individually at one time step. And the next time step, they all interact. And that's one of the real limiting factors is our memory bandwidth at that time step in which they all interact. How do I get data from all these individual grid cells? And we could be talking you know, billions of grid cells to interact with each other. So when we design a supercomputer like uh, Aurora, we really pay attention, not just to the number of CPUs or the speed of CPUs, but the speed at which data can be transferred between them. Excellent. All right, got a good one here for Dave. Um, so obviously one of the reasons that we're using radioisotopes is because they decay. And that's really how we, in effect, in a lot of cases, kill the cancer cell. Um, does that present problems when you're trying to transport the material from where we make it here at Argonne to the hospitals that use it? Uh, typically, no. What we do, and here's your quick lightning answer. No, it's not a problem. We just ship more. <laughs> <laughs> so what ends up happening is that we allow for a, a certain um, decay allowance uh, to account for the shipping time. That way, the hospitals get the uh, correct dose that they need on, at the time that they need it. Excellent. So Bobby, I'm trying to look for a good uh, neuroscience question here, just scanning through here. So um, let's talk about the technologies a little bit. So you alluded to the microscopes at the advanced photon source and other things like, uh, like that. Um, but for this, uh, these really, really tiny neurons and synapses in the brain, what technologies do you use to actually be able to see those and map these billions of different uh, cells and connections? Yeah, so the sort of gold standard that the, when people map connections between neurons, this is a very specific kind of microscopic technique called electron microscopy. 
And the difference between electron microscopy and most other kind of microscopes that you think about is most other kind of microscopes use visible light, either from a source or out from stars, uh, 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 et cetera. And visible light uh, is remarkable, but it in itself has a kind of physical nature to it. It has a wavelength. Sometimes the light is 500 nanometers long, sometimes it's 400 nanometers long. Uh, 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 and instead, what we use is electrons. And that's because electrons are actually less than one nanometer. So they're at some scale where they're at the scale of the connections between the uh, 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 neurons. Electron microscopy is a very old technique. Uh, uh, and what we have done is try to automate it, just like the um, original the uh, uh, way we used to sequence uh, uh, genomes is actually based on a very old technique for finding out the order of base pairs. And really the revolution for the Human Genome Project was to automate that process. The actual real revolution, which is still happening, is to make sense of that process, but at least to collect the data, uh, it was to automate that process. So what we've really done is just sort of in Rube Goldberg-esque fashion, step by step, try to automate all the steps of using an electron microscope. And that is sort of the major technological breakthrough while we wait for the next uh, generation of x-rays and the next uh, 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 synchrotron sources to get to uh, uh, EM resolution. Excellent. All right, so we got one that's gonna go back to Dave here on uh, the radioisotopes. So which cancers are now immunodeveloped to radioisotope therapy? And which cancers do we expect, uh, even just in the near future, perhaps, to be treatable? Um, okay. What are we? What, what are the targets that we can help? Yeah, sure. Um, so, let me let me answer that in a roundabout way. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, a lot of these cancers have biomarkers on them. Well, what scientists are finding out now is that there are uh, certain biomarkers that multiple different cancers all express. Um, there may be, for example, breast cancers have um, the HER2 gene or other genes like that that are expressed, but they also have this other one that's called SSTR2 or something along those lines. And that can be targeted with uh, a somatosta somatostatin. Um, so there's, there's several different um, pharmaceuticals that are out there, radio pharmaceuticals that are out there can, that can target this SSTR um, gene. And so it can be used for several different cancers. But the problem is you have to go through the, the clinical studies and then FDA approval for each one of the specific cancers that you're looking at. Right now, Lutathera, which this is a lutetium 177 based radio pharmaceutical, uh, is out there and it just got approved last year for uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, some other ones that are currently uh, in clinical trials um, are, it's called Dotatate. Um, and what this is, is it's a, it could be a lutetium 177 based radio pharmaceutical or other isotope. But this one was the one that we were looking at earlier specific for prostate cancer. And this one is in uh, phase three clinical trials right now. Um, but then there's a slew of drugs that are out there uh, for just imaging cancers. One of the most popular ones is an F18 based one. It's a uh, FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. Cancers are fast growing tissues and fast growing tissues need sugar. So they uptake these things and you can get a very nice image to show where these cancers are. But we're trying to expand the use of more bang for the buck, so to speak. So we have one drug out there and we can use it for multiple tumors, but we have to go through the trials. Yeah, that's a very expensive process, very time consuming. Let's actually turn to Scott. I've got a good one for you. So a um, uh, lot of uh, 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 coverage in the news, of course, over the heat dome that's over Canada and the uh, northwestern United States. Did we predict that? Is that something we could have seen coming or is that still out of our ability? Is that something we're still aiming for? So this is where we come to the difference between climate and weather. Climate is what you expect weather is what you get. So you can imagine climate as being that long bass line in a song while the riff is the actual weather, the much more frequent thing. So we can't predict a particular weather event more than a couple of days out. There's just too much chaos in our atmosphere. And as I said before, we don't have that perfect picture of where the atmosphere is now. But with climate models and looking at the climate, what we do is we run it for a very, very long time and then we look at the statistics. And our climate model simulations predict that as the temperature increases, 
the extremes increase even more. That's the crazy thing about this whole thing. And sometimes in ways you don't really expect, and I don't have time to really go into that. So the answer is twofold. One, we managed to predict this was going to happen a couple of days out, and that really helped emergency um, services really prepare for this. But two, this kind of event is borne out and predicted in climate simulations. And I'm sorry, but frankly, we can expect it to get a lot worse. It's very sobering, very sobering here. So I've got uh, probably what may be one of the hardest questions, and Katrine, uh, Katrin, excuse me, um, I've saved this one for you, and I think it really just gets to the nature of the universe. And a couple of people have asked uh, variants of this. So you talked about how dark energy and matter are affecting the universe. What are they? Do we have any clue what's going on uh, other than the observational effect of these phenomena? So that's actually a, a very, very good question. And that is exactly what we want to figure out. What are they? So with dark matter, for example, we had a lot of good ideas. So like supermassive black holes was one of uh, one idea that we had. And um, so we did a lot of calculations. And it turns out, no, it can't be. It's, it's just not enough of them. It, it wouldn't work. Brown dwarfs was another idea that we had. And again, we did the calculation. Um, we looked at what the effects would be and we find like, no, it's not working. So what we are doing right now is, so we are hoping that the dark matter is really a kind of particle and that it somehow interacts very, very weakly with us so that we can actually detect it in a big detector. So we are building very, very large detectors, very massive detectors. And what we will see if this idea is right and it might be not right, um, that we see like very, very rarely an event happening in that very large detector, like a handful per year. And so we can record them and then make sure that we are not seeing some background events um, that, that is something else in dark matter and trying to figure it out like that. So, so we have lots of ideas and we have ideas how to measure the effects of the dark energy in that sense. And um, then we can reject these ideas if, they are, if, if it turns not out not to be right, or, or hopefully we'll find something. With dark energy, it's, it's very similar. So right now we have a very, very simple idea, but it's the origin um, is not explained. And as a physicist, you always want to know where does it come from? And so one idea that we have is, and um, I, I really, I'm almost scared to say this, but Einstein might have been wrong in his um, theory of general relativity on very, very large scales, it's slightly different. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one way how we could generate something um, that looks like an accelerated expansion. Mm -hmm. But again, Einstein being wrong, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Another idea that we can have is that there's actually something called a scalar field um, that generates this accelerated expansion. And what would happen then is that the influence of the dark energy on these structures that I discussed before would be different at different times. And we could see this again. So, so what we do is we formulate this very simplest idea of the dark energy that we have right now, we make the measurements and we see if we break this very simplest idea. And if we break it, then we have a clue and we can think again and go back to pencil, pencil and paper and write down another theory. So it's, it's hopefully again in 10 years from now, I will come back and tell you like, yeah, we actually have a clue, but it might be that we are at the same point where we are right now and, and we still don't know. Um, so again, it's exciting, challenging. And I think I'll paraphrase uh, the Sherlock Holmes quote, uh, once you eliminate the impossible, what's left, no, mar no, no matter how improbable, has got to be the answer. Yes. So I uh, want to follow on just for, uh, very quickly on that, and you sort of touched on this a little bit, um, or what we're exploring about dark energy and uh, uh, dark matter, is that giving us any insights into gravity, nature of gravity? Yes, it does. Um, so, so again, um, if, if we find that on very large scales, we find something that is not compatible, compatible with um, general relativity, we have learned something about gravity. So there might be different rules out there on very large scales um, that we haven't discovered yet. Um, so yes, we'll, we'll definitely learn something. Um, so, so yeah. So we're actually getting uh, close to the end and I wanna try and uh, um, end this on an uplifting note, um, particularly given some of the conversation we've had around climate. So now turning back again to Scott. So, um, uh, you know, obviously climate change is something that could be de very devastating for communities. We've talked about a couple of examples of that. Um, are you uncovering areas of hope regarding climate change? Are there things that we're learning about the climate that actually are positive that people can take away as uh, a seed of hope as we move forward? Yeah, there are some. For one thing, you know, we're in charge here and there are so many new technologies 
that are coming out that uh, not only ameliorate climate change, but also uh, um, get rid of a whole bunch of other toxins, which are terrible to be around. Things like solar, wind, um, things like geothermal, wave power um, has really come a long way. The efficiency of solar cells has undergone orders of magnitude improvement. So technology is really rapidly moving to take over. And I, I have to agree with our new Secretary of Energy, Sarah, um, Jennifer Granhold, where, you know, energy jobs are going to be the real nice jobs of the future. And we're really seeing that now in the private sector in collaboration with the public sector. And one thing Argonne does really well is, you know, solar cells and batteries um, really stepping up to this challenge. Excellent. Really fascinating discussion. And we've got a couple of minutes left. I uh, just want to remind people if they have anything that we haven't covered, uh, let's give you a couple of seconds to try and get something uh, in here. And um, while uh, we're giving people a chance to do that, I'm going to throw a last question at Bobby about the nature of consciousness and reality, because we got to go there. So do you think the world or reality is, mer is merely a thought experiment in the brain? <laughs> uh, we're going to give you a chance to be philosophical. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 so I, I don't know exactly how to uh, answer this question. I do think it's a, it's a question for philosophers broadly, but I will tell you what, what I know around the edges of it. First is it's obviously true that what we perceive as reality is not an accurate representation of reality. Uh, we know, for example, that in our retinas, the parts where we look out into the world, there's a part where all the nerves send all their nerve cells out of the retina. But it turns out at that spot called the blind spot, you can't actually see. Uh, uh, so in every image you take of the world, there's a big blind spot in it, but your eyes move around so fast that your brain fills in that uh, 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 spot. Uh, uh, so it appears that the world doesn't have this huge spot in it. So, so we know for sure that the, our brains are, 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 are changing the reality, changing the nature of the photons that uh, 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 strike our uh, 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 eyes and then convert. So it isn't that hard to think that that's probably true for all our other senses as well. There's a surprising thing uh, effect called the cocktail party, which I'm losing a cocktail party effect, which I'm losing as I get older. This is the ability to be in a cocktail party, to have a conversation with one person and essentially tune out, not pay attention uh, uh, to the rest of the conversations uh, uh, occurring around you. That's our brain again, making our own version of reality relative to the actual sounds uh, 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 that you receive. And, and by the way, by the way, I think they should rename that the teenager effect because my 14 year old has got that nailed. Yeah, and it, surprisingly, a lot of that's what's fun about being a neuroscientist is you could see I can see myself losing it uh, uh, <laughs> as I get older. Uh, 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 that all conversations seem to become equally valid at one moment in time, and it, it's, it's shocking. Uh, so, so that's me waking up to reality, if you will. Uh, 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 so I, I, I think it's definitely true, and, and we know actually from not work from neuroscientists too, but work from psychologists too, that it's very easy for people to have worldviews uh, 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 that are really incompatible with how the world really works. Uh, so so, so I, I believe that, the, uh, that uh, uh, that's true. The other thing I could say about consciousness, which is, uh, I think the most that I could actually say uh, 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 in, in a science sense, is that all of our brains go, have, go through a moment when they are less conscious than they are now. When we are babies, uh, 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 we are not as conscious of ourselves and of the world around us as we are as adults. And anyone who's seen a baby or, or raised children know there are moments where they just spend hours looking at their hands, trying to realize that that hand is the end of their body and the rest of the world starts outside of it. Uh, um, now, uh, that means that there's a moment where the brain you have was not conscious and is now much more conscious than it used to be, which if I took that logic further, the wiring diagram of that baby, uh, the connections uh, between those neurons in a baby versus the connections between the neurons in an adult, that's a lot of connections, it's a big comparison, uh, uh, should somehow reflect the physical nature of consciousness. Now, that's a lot of data and a lot of analysis for me to, to do, but that's one of the things that the, I'm interested in broadly. 
Very interesting. So I, I really want to thank everybody for uh, just the fascinating discussion tonight. I also want to uh, make a preemptive uh, offer to the audience. Uh, let's do this again in about 10 years. We'll check in with each of our researchers and really see how things have evolved according to their predictions. Um, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get to rate them on it. We'll have a rating system so that you can call them when they're wrong. Um, really a great discussion. Really want to thank our distinguished panelists and our audience uh, for contributing to this uh, really great conversation. And now as I lose my voice, let me turn back over to Robin who'll conclude the program for this evening. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, this was really a tremendous um, uh, conversation. I, I've enjoyed it immensely. I wanna thank, I hope all of our audience has as well. And I really wanna thank you, Stephen, Katrin, Scott, Bobby, and Dave for sharing such interesting information and insights about your research. I'd also like to thank you, the members of our virtual audience for attending and for your very thoughtful questions. This event has been recorded and we will email it to you for listening again and for sharing with colleagues, friends, and family. Our next out loud lecture entitled The Five W's of Quantum will be held on Thursday, August 26. That happens to be the one year anniversary of the announcement of the launch of QNEXT, a Department of Energy National Quantum Science Center led by Argonne and home to some of the nation's most exciting research in quantum information science. We, look, we um, will be looking at what quantum information science is and why its development is so important to maintaining U.S. global economic leadership. Until then, we hope you enjoyed your virtual visit with Argonne this evening. Be well and have a good night.